big thing, I suppose, that a lot of parents and children and students in Ireland are concerned about is the education system. And we want run um, a, a website called Teach Don't Preach, where we write articles uh, um, about the education system and about everything that is going on on a daily basis in the education system in relation to religion and discrimination. Um, one of the main things that we do as well in the background is that we help parents that have been discriminated against. We keep this very kind, we keep this quiet because a lot of parents don't want to go public about it, but uh, um, they would have issues on opting out of religion in schools. Now, it is difficult for me to sit here and to tell you today that I can't believe it a lot myself in 2018, but there are children going to school that are still forced into religion. Now, there's a constitutional right to opt out, but I hear about those things all the time. I can't believe what's going on sometimes in our schools. I'm shocked. Uh, there is an incident today, and it's not actually in a Catholic school. It's been going on uh, for the past week. Um, it is to do with a court, a Catholic uh, agency, and sex education in our schools. And in, uh, a parent got in touch with me there last week to say that a court were going into their school and they were going to teach sex education. It's a primary school today. And they had complained to the school about uh, the sex education, inviting a court in, that a court were a Catholic agency. Now, this is not a Catholic school. This was an Educate Together school. Now, the parent has complained to the principal, complained to the board of management, and she has got nowhere. Uh, I tried to get the media involved, and the media are interested, but the problem is that parents on the ground are still haven't got the confidence to come forward and speak to the media a lot. They are terrified that their children will be victimised. And I don't know how to sometimes overcome that. We seem to have got confidence in relation uh, to women's rights over the years, and they spoke out about abortion, and that was great, and we really needed that. But to give parents in schools confidence to complain, to speak to the media about what is going on um, is very, very difficult because they're terrified their children are going to get victimised. And uh, it is bad enough if you are a minority in a lot of our schools, uh, you feel left out, uh, your children are sitting at the back of the class if they opt out of religion, and another issue would come up over the sex education. So a lot of minorities religious minorities and uh, immigrants do not want to challenge this because they don't want to feel different and they're worried about their children. So that was, that's what came up, that's one of the things that came up this week over a court in an ET school, an Educate Together school, which is very disappointing and um, she did say she got onto the patron body and the patron body um, uh, hasn't done anything about it. But a court do go into what we would refer to as public schools, state schools, they go into um, ETB schools, the old vocational schools, and um, we have got loads of documents under uh, FOI, um, and we can see that the schools pay them. So uh, the money is going from the state into the schools, and the schools then are paying a Catholic agency to come in and do a state course to give talks on a state sex education. So next week, actually, we're in front of the Oireachtas Committee, the, the um, Education Committee, and we were speaking on um, sex education in schools, and we've made a submission and everything like that. So, um, those are the types of complaints that we get in the background. Um, other types of uh, complaints would be, even they're forced into mass, and I not only get complaints from secular parents and atheists, but I get complaints from religious minorities. And even I, we get complaints from Catholic parents, because as you know, all those Catholics voted yes, overwhelmingly voted yes, obviously, in the referendum. So they don't believe everything that is go, uh, being taught in Catholic schools, and some of them want to opt out their child out of religion. Now, a lot of parents these days are not willing to force their children, especially at second level, to do take religion class even though sometimes the school says it's compulsory, they, do, they will not do it. So the child 
uh, uh, the young student comes and says, I want to opt out on religion, can you help me do it? If it is, it, if they are a Catholic family, they go down to the school and sometimes the school has said no again. So I have a, we have a, a standard letter on Teach Don't Preach for opting out at the different levels. It's opting out at primary, opting, opting out at second level. And we had to do a letter then up for Catholic families who want to opt their child out of Catholic religious instruction in school. And um, we uh, uh, do all that kind of thing. But it's not only religious instruction in school that is a problem sometimes, because there is a constitutional right to opt out. It is in the Constitution, 4424, and it's reflected in the Education Act as well. But of all the things that is in the Constitution, I find it extraordinary that I'm left, and we're left, dealing with parents that can't opt their children out of religion. If, if you, even to this day, if you go on to uh, some school websites and look at their um, religious education policy, they'll tell you that all students have to take religion. That was last week, somebody was, came to me and sent me an email saying, look, this is in the school, my child is going to this school uh, come September. It says that we have to take religion. Surely we don't have to take religion. She has to take religion. She's never done religion. They had lived outside the country and were coming back into the country. The child had never done religion. And uh, the school said, no, all, all students have to take uh, um, religion. And uh, of course, that wasn't true because there is a constitutional right to opt out. So the same, what we did was we give parents advice um, and on, on their rights and how to opt out and particularly it's section 30 in the education act and they went back to the school and then the school agreed only after the parent quoting the constitutional rights and the section of the education act now to get a job you have to as a principal in a school you have to know these issues so it they are, it is a they're using this as a means to coerce um, all children and students into religion. <coughs> so that's that's one of the other things. But the, uh, uh, um, but, uh, as well as that, religion in Irish schools, especially schools under the under the patronage of the Catholic Church, and then a lot of ETB schools, which are our public schools, integrate religion into the curriculum and the daily life of the school. Now, they're not obliged, that's part of what they refer to as their ethos. They're not obliged under the Education Act to write that down at all. So if, if you send your child to school and you opt your child out of religion, and that happens and you do that, but the child is sitting at the back of the class, they're still getting influenced and evangelised in other areas under the curriculum that you don't know about. For example, <laughs> some of the uh, um, school books, like for young children, the spelling books, they do word ser searches, and one of the things would be the Saviour, you know, or St. Patrick, or Mary, and those type of things, they integrate them. And some schools would have prayers over the intercom. Now, um, my children's in their second level school, they prayed over the intercom at 11 o'clock every morning. Um, and that was um, a state school, an ETB school, and they actually, and I, it is good a few years ago, but they actually one, one day prayed for atheists, my daughter told me, you know, <laughs> you know, that they would find God. It never happened. <laughs> you know? Still hope. <laughs> so those are the type of complaints we get, and um, uh, I've often, we talk to Muslim parents as well, who have sometimes great difficulty with negotiating the system. And um, we even have, um, Atheist Ireland has uh, an alliance with the Imadi Muslims and the Evangelical Christians because religious parents want secular education. They want secular education, minorities. Minorities and religious minorities as well as atheists and secularists are discriminated in the education system. And um, they have told us that um, their children are forced into religion, um, their children are forced into mass, and um, the Evangelical Alliance, um, Nick Park, Pastor Nick Park, has told us that um, 
a, a principal in a school told one of the members of his, his congregation that if the child didn't go to Mass, that he would drag her by the hair to Mass. So he had to go into the school and speak about that. I, I, about a couple of years ago as well, um, down in Castle Troy in Limerick, this was a big story. There was, in an ETB school, this was a state school now, uh, they were forcing a child into religion. And uh, he went, he came to us, and I couldn't believe my ears when he said he talked to the papers and talked to the media. And he did talk to the media, and literally there was an avalanche of the media were down outside that school in Castle Troy in Limerick. They had to have a board and management meeting to decide whether that child could opt out of religion. When that child had a constitutional right to opt out, and it's in the Education Act. <coughs> so that is going on in the background. It's quietly going on in the background because parents are afraid to speak out openly about what is going on because they're afraid their children will be victimised. And we're trying to uh, give them confidence to do that. And things, but things have getting, are getting better. We have more parents saying that they're going to, they want to opt out, and we try and help them in every way we can. Now the media are interested in all this area in a big way, but as you know, the media they like the human stories. So if I have know that something is going on and there's some issue going on in the school. It is very difficult to find a parent, there's somebody that will speak openly to the media. The media has to get that verified. So it is essential that we um, give parents the confidence to speak out and to challenge what is going on in our schools, especially in relation to religion. Um, as I, I did speak about the sex education thing and accord, <coughs> And as you know, there's a review going on of the, uh, the Oireachtas Education Committee, and we're involved in that. And um, Ruth Coppinger, the Solidarity Party, they have a bill that's going through, the Objective Sex Education Bill, and we support that. And that is really significant, that bill, because they've identified the areas in the Education Act that need to be changed so that all children and students have access to objective sex education. As it stands now, the uh, schools can deliver sex education according to their ethos. Now there is a curriculum at primary and second level on sex education. And the minister, uh, or the previous ministers, and all previous ministers, recognise that students have a right to objective sex education. They recognise that there are these, what they refer to as circular letters that go into schools. And in the circular letter on sex education, um, it says that under the, the European Social Charter, I think it's section 11 or article 11, that all students have a right to objective sex education. But then it goes on in the, in the circular letter to say that, if, um, you know, that schools deliver um, can deliver it according to their ethos. Now the ethos of the vast majority of our schools at primary and at second level is Catholic. So what you are getting, they might deliver the content of the curriculum. You know, they, they, they t say what's in the curriculum, but they deliver it according to a Catholic ethos. So they will, in part of the Catholic ethos then, and I, I actually forgot to, to bring the religion book with me. We buy religion books in 18th Ireland. <laughs> you know, it actually talks about um, uh, the right to uh, um, life from conception to natural death, and it and they say that abortion is forbidden. So that's in the curriculum, and they are, as far as I know, they d this is being taught to sixth class. Because as you said, they have a new curriculum and it's all written down. So um, we'll be looking at getting um, those books um, in the near future. I think they're doing fifth and sixth in the Grow and Love to see what they're saying there uh, in those. And we get the teacher's man manual and we see that. So we have to challenge that. We all have to challenge this sex education. And we can, it, it will not stop unless the legislation is passed. 
no matter what he says, he'll say, uh, Richard Bruton has got up at the door and I listened to him, he's talking about, we'll talk about factual sex, sexual education, but he can say all he likes. The schools still, under section 15 in the Education Act, have, uh, have a, a right to deliver sex education according to their ethos. And we have to have a change in the Education Act for all this to happen. And the good thing about it is, and how that links in with the abortion campaign was that um, the Citizens' Assembly and the Eroctus Committees, they all as well recommended sex, objective sex education in schools. And it seems that it will go hand in hand uh, um, when they bring in the legislation to, uh, um, for abortion. They will also um, supplement um, the law and hopefully make sure that every child has a right and can get access to objective sex education. So what we're trying to do at the moment is maybe working within in that system is to say that um, in, in schools under a Catholic patronage, if those parents, uh, Catholic parents, want Catholic sex education, they can get at that in the religion class. They can still go to the religion class. Mm. But the state course on relationship and sexuality education, that must be objective. And there is a way of doing that. It isn't unconstitutional. You can challenge that. He can do it, the minister. If there is a will, they can do that. And that it would be a huge step forward. But, uh, um, of course, it's going to be a bit of a fight. Uh, but we'll, we'll keep up that and we'll keep... Um, fighting for that. So it's not under, only under the European Social Charter that there's this right to objective sex education, but also it's under the rights of the child. There's various um, UN recommendations. Now another whole area that we get into as well is there is actually about 12 recommendations from various UN bodies on our education system. And it's not just about access but it's about the curriculum and the rights of minorities and the rights of parents to a secular education. So for years what uh, we have been doing in Atheist Ireland, we have been doing submissions to the UN under the various treaties that Ireland has ratified. Um, uh, the, rights of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the uh, Convention on Civil and Political Rights, Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the um, CERD, which is the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and uh, there are also Council of Europe treaties there as well. And we have made so many submissions to those over the years. And we, we go over to the UN when Ireland is up before the UN, and we tell, we get a chance to speak, and we tell, um, the U, like for example, the UN Human Rights Committee about the discrimination that's going on in the Irish education system. Now, you could have a 20 uh, person delegation there from the state as well, and various ministers have gone on. But we're there and we say this is discrimination in access to schools. Now, for years, we've all known that, it, and it is going, that this discrimination in the Equal Status Act, they can refuse your child access and give preference to um, Catholics in. Um, majority of our schools but when you say this at the UN they look at you and people can't believe that you're saying that they can refuse you access to a publicly funded school because you can't produce a Catholic birth cert or baptism cert. they just they just can't believe it so you go over there and you're not arguing that this is discrimination and we're still at the stage I'm arguing with people that this, it, this was religious discrimination. Um, the state, when they uh, um, brought that in a few years ago, um, one time at the UN they were calling it lawful oversubscription criteria. Lawful over <coughs> Section 7 of the Equal Status Act, it's religious discrimination. They don't want to get into calling that, so you always call it what it is. It is religious discrimination. I've even argued with there's some religious parents have discussion with it and they won't accept that that's religious discrimination. It's like a head in the sand thing, you know, that why would my children or your children not have access to their local school uh, um, because they're not Catholic? 
why should they go down the list when and all of their, their neighbours, uh, my child's neighbours and friends, are up the list because they have a baptismal certificate. It is no wonder that parents are getting their children baptised to get them into the local school. And that is happening. It has happened in my own family as well. We know it's happening, especially in areas where there was oversubscription. But that was, I mean, that is, that was nearly kind of easy because it's in your face religious discrimination, direct discrimination. But a lot of the discrimination happens within the schools itself. And that's where the main, main religious discrimination is, as a religion is getting integrated into the curriculum. And um, religious minorities and immigrants as well cannot opt out of that. And why should we have to opt our children out of a public, our class in a public funded school? We want to opt in to an education that is objective, critical, and pluralistic. And we don't want to be opting our children. So they have nothing else. Or, um, if you opt your child out of religion class, they have nothing else. They sit down in the back of the class. And as I explained to you, part of the Catholic philosophy on education is integrating the religion right into the whole curriculum. So it's not, it's not confined to the religion class, it is integrated into the whole curriculum. As well as that with symbols as well on, on the walls. And that came up actually in the, re in the referendum because a lot of the polling took place in schools and they all had religious symbols. I mean, some of the pictures, people were sending me pictures mm. and I was tweeting at the referendum commission had the at Ireland account. So I was tweeting at pic the pictures of the schools with the uh, religious uh, uh, symbols into the referendum commission and complaining about they were it being influenced, they were trying to influence them, but I mean, they even have the Bible on some polling desks, and that's to do with the electoral, electoral act as well, and that's another story to do with oaths and all that kind of thing, and that's another piece of discrimination. So, uh, um, so that is what we kind of do in Teach and Preach and Atheist Ireland. We also go over to the OSCE, which is the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe. They have a huge conference every year um, on freedom of religion and belief. And uh, we go over there and make, uh, we get a chance to make a statement. I think, how many countries is it? 46, I think 47 delegations from various countries are at that. It's the biggest conference of its kind, and nobody's ever heard of it. <laughs> I know they haven't uh, um, in Europe, though. But we go over there, um, we have raised the abortion issue in the past over there, and um, we raised the education system, and particularly um, in relation to the religious discrimination in access, and then we also raised blasphemy, and, and that kind of thing. Now another area, we have a thing as well that we call the Schools Equality Pact, which is um, the four areas that we are challenging, which is patronage. As you know, um, the schools, the state provides for, it says in the constitution, provides for the education of children. That doesn't mean that the state can't provide education, but what it has decided to do in the past with the influence of the Catholic Church, is to provide for the education of children in schools under the patronage. The Irish education system is unique. No other country in the world has an education system like ours. None. And because nobody would be stupid enough to put in place, or nobody would be stupid enough to hand over um, education to private religious bodies in the main. Nobody would do it. And another area, I don't know whether you all remember there recently, a, a few years ago, was the Louise O'Keefe case at the European Court. She was a Cork woman that was abused in our primary school. The, the, our Supreme Court found the state wasn't responsible. So what, what they were saying to us was the state wasn't responsible for the protection of a small child while that child was accessing her education in a primary school, a national school as they're called, publicly funded. That's what the state, a few years ago, said to Louise O'Keefe. Now she went to the European Court and won her case. 
because the European Court and the European Court said the state cannot absolve itself of the responsibility um, to educate by delegating that responsibility to private bodies and institutions. Now, it wasn't just in relation to Article 3 and 13 that she fought her case under. 3 is cruel and inhuman <coughs> behaviour or uh, abuse, and Article 13 is the right to an effective remedy. Uh, we can use that court case, and when there are other court cases at the European Court, um, to hold the state responsible for their failure to protect and respect our philosophical convictions in relation to the education of our children. That is an area that needs to be explored. Now, it is very difficult. Louise O'Keefe uh, was a very strong uh, woman, and she went through 15 years it took her to get through the courts. She and uh, um, she nearly lost her house doing it. So everything seems to be in the way of trying to access and challenge this to the courts. So um, there's a whole lot of work, I'm afraid, um, to be done there. <coughs> now, in other areas we could look at, that's, that's the European Court. So we have, we have a way of going, we can get to the European Court. And I could say even now, I think, I honestly believe that we would win. There is case law with other education systems, uh, um, such as Norway. We, we have them all documented. We know all the cases. We use them all the time to uh, um, say, look, it says here in this case on the European Court, you can't be doing that. So we use them all the time. So that, that we would win, that they are breaching our human rights. The, U, the UN has said that. The UN has said that you're breaching the rights of secular parents in the education system. And they're saying that you're discriminating to the state. They made recommendations on discrimination, freedom of conscience, right to be free from discrimination, and the right to an effective remedy. You have a right to an effective remedy to get you to the courts. None of these rights are worth the paper they're written on if you haven't got somewhere to go when you have a complaint. <coughs> in the school and at the moment if you go to the department of education the parents go to the department of education they just say take it up with the school board we go to the school board waste of time in many instances you still can't get anywhere nobody has taken of all the years that that equal status was there nobody took a case under the equal status act on discrimination in relation to schools nobody has taken a case really it's just very, very difficult for parents, and, and I told you about that issue of them being afraid that their children will be victimised. Because if you have a child in a school and you're going to take the school to under, you know, under the equality legislation, your child is still in school. And even if you had taken the, the local school, um, say, my child has been discriminated, they're not letting her into school, you know what I mean? There's, I can't see a reason. I know the Equal Status Act is there, but she's not going to undermine the ethos of the school. She's only five years old. Nobody's even taken a case like that. But you could have to go to another area, but it's still a Catholic school. So you'd still end up going to another Catholic school. So your child be going through the education system while you're challenging the patron body and the managers of your school as such, and the school and the school. So that's why it is, it is particularly difficult to challenge the education system in, in those areas. So the EU equality legislation, you would think we'd be in the EU, EU great. We have the, those directives, but Ireland, and it was Ireland, negotiated opt-outs for religious bodies in those, in, the, in, in those. Now there is the race directive, and both the Irish Human Rights Commission and uh, the Ombudsman for Children has said that there's an issue under the race directive with discrimination in schools because there's no opt-outs in the race directive. So, but ha it would be very difficult to expect a migrant um, in the school system to challenge the whole si school system. But there, there is something there in that one. And that takes precedence over our constitution, the, the, the directives, but not the case law of the European Court or um, the recommendations from the UN. But there are 12 recommendations, which is a huge amount. 
So another area um, which doesn't get a huge amount of um, uh, media coverage is teachers and access to the teaching profession. Again, there's an opt-out in the equality legislation, section 37. Section 37 on religion is still in there. Now they changed it for LGBT, but they didn't change it for religion. So in your contract, if you get a job as a teacher, you are expected to um, deliver um, Catholic religious instruction to the pupils. And you're expected to uphold the ethos of the school. It's not even confined to within the school. I can't see them ever doing it in the Catholic Church, but it's your life outside the school that could be in, in challenged as well. It happens in other countries. I've seen, I've seen it happen in American, in American things like that, but um, it hasn't happened. And I, I would think that they wouldn't dare do that. But still, there are teachers that are quite nervous about that. So they can fire you if you undermine the ethos of their school. You cannot, you, ne you need a certificate in religious studies, they call it, Catholic certificate in religious studies, to get a job in a Catholic school. And that certificate um, lets, uh, uh, is in a, the approval and the training from the Catholic Church to teach Catholic religious instruction. And you know at primary level you have classes, the teacher and the class, so it's not like you have religious, second level you have religious instruction, and then you have geography, another teacher does geography. So in the primary level, migrants and religious minorities cannot get into the teaching profession. They, they can't get into the teaching profession because they haven't got a certificate in religious studies. Now, in a way, it's, you know what Ireland is like, we pretend, uh, you know, it, once you, a lot of people are being baptised and then they just drop out of the Catholic. So you could actually pretend, as an atheist, pretend you were a Catholic and if you want to be a teacher and go ahead and do that. But it's very difficult for Muslims. If you belong to a minority religious community and, you're, and, and if you are a migrant as well in the country, uh, it's very difficult to hide that. You know, so they can't get into the teaching profession. And that is another area that the UN has brought up at the state over access to public services for uh, um, religious minorities and migrants. Because uh, uh, especially a lot I've heard now, I know somebody that's working uh, um, in that area and a lot of uh, refugees on that would be interested in getting into the teaching profession. Now I know there's an issue over the Irish thing, but it's very difficult to get over the religion thing, you know? It, it really is. So that's an area that we're working on as well. And um, I just have a look at any other areas. As you see, I could go on forever. You know, I get very boring after a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, but in the last few years, it got, the last few years, we have found that the Catholic Church are tightening their grip on the education system. They're not loosening it. In fact, in the classroom, most classrooms now, you have a prayer table, you'll have a cross, they'll have the Bible on a desk. So that has crept its way into the classrooms because they have this new course called Grow in Love. You know, and then another area is um, with hiring of principals in schools. They um, have, into, there's this new courses on, um, I think they call them, the master, the masters in Christian leadership. So if you've got that and you're trying to get a job as a principal, you get, you know, that's what you're going to get it over other people, and that's so that the the principal will be able to keep um, the religious ethos in the school. And then um, I could go on about the ETBIs, state schools. We had a huge um, freedom of information request in with a few of the ETBs. We had to crowdfund because they charged us. They can charge you under the Freedom of Information Act. We had to crowdfund. But the Catholic Church has its grip over a lot of those ETBs. And this new divestment process going into the new community national schools is very, very worrying because um, the ETBI, which is the umbrella body, is not a public body. So they are in discussions with the Catholic Church. They have a, a subgroup um, over these community national schools. They seem to put policy together. They're not accountable. They're, 
they're not accountable to the Oireachtas Committee. So I can't put in an FOI and see what arrangements they've been making with the Catholic Church over community national schools. I've got some documents from the ETBs, which are public bodies, uh, um, so we, we get a bit of an idea of what's going on in the background. But I have a document that we got from the Cork ETB, which is, um, it refers to a meeting between the EPI, which is their umbrella body, and the Catholic Church, and it says that the ETBI has assured the Catholic Church that the new community national schools are not secular schools. So, I mean, I don't know where to go from that. So this is just, so this is all going on in the background. And then as well, the money shifts, the, uh, uh, we could get into the whole funding thing area as well. A body, the patron body that runs are the management body, the Catholic Primary Schools Management Association. State gives that funding. They charge, the Catholic Primary Schools Management Association charges the schools you know, um, on the uh, um, for a fee for being part of the Catholic Primary Schools Management Association. So they're getting state funding, money is coming in, out from the state, into the schools, back into the Catholic Primary Schools Management Association. And then, I only discovered this, I think, uh, was it last year, that they actually, the state actually lets that body second teachers, and it's supposed to be a shortage of teachers, mm -hmm. to work in the CPMSA. Right now, I have had interviews, been interviewed by the media with uh, um, um, the chair or the CEO of the CPMSA. They're not part of the standards in public office. They don't have to register with them, but we have to register with them. <coughs> we have to. So they're getting state funding. They're um, lobbying politicians. They're lobbying in in the media and everything to keep the status quo, to keep the system the way it is. They don't have to register with CIPO, and we have to register with CIPO. And uh, which we don't mind registering with CIPO. We haven't got an issue. We don't get all that money. We don't get major funding from outside the country, or we don't get huge funding within the system. But we still lobby, and we've still been pretty effective. They're getting state funding. They're seconding teachers. They're getting money from the schools, and they're not registered with CIPO. And there, besides all that, things have over the years, because I've been at this for a long time. I think I started at the, in this area about 2006, when my children were discriminated in school. I went to everybody for help, and nobody could help me. Nobody. I got tea and sympathy, but nobody would do anything. Absolutely nobody. And so. This, this is why I'm here today and why I challenge this, because discrimination hurts. It's happening all the time in the Irish education system because the Catholic Church has a grip on that system and there is no separation of church and state. Thank you. Thank you.